I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. I view. Good morning. Nehemiah 1. Open the Old Testament, man. It's like Christmas for me right now. You know, if you know me well, Nehemiah 1. If you're looking for it, open your Bible halfway open about, and you'll find the book of the Psalms. You go back three books from the Psalms, you'll find Nehemiah right after Ezra. So glad to be here this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Blake Hodges. I'm the pastor here at East Campus. And today is a good day if you are visiting with us to join us because we're launching into the book of Nehemiah. We're gonna talk about restoring the vision. That'll be a little more clear um, as, as we get to moving on. But we have chosen this book with great intentionality because it's really going to be such a timely word and relevant word as to where we are as a church family and to where we are as a city, even a nation in these moments. Now, I know y'all are fired up about death being arrested, but I need you to get just as fired up about biblical history for a minute, okay? Can we pull up some dates? Because we need to have a back, we need to do a little background work if we are going to understand why Nehemiah. But I believe once we do it, we'll really begin to resonate with the position that Nehemiah was in. First things first, if we look all the way back close to the beginning of Israel really getting going as a nation, what we have at 1400 BC is the giving of the law, the 10 commandments, the Mosaic covenant. God promised Israel that if they were obedient, they would be, I need y'all this morning. Come on. If y'all were obedient, if they were obedient, they'd be what? Blessed. That's right. If they were not faithful to the covenant, they would be cursed and they would be scattered ultimately as seen in Deuteronomy in the book of Leviticus. And of course, Being sinners, as every single one of us is, the nation can never make it on their own merit. Starting in 931, sin ravaging just the nation, idolatry within leadership, the nation broke in two around 931 BC. Continued to worsen around the 700s BC, uh, Assyria exiled the Northern Kingdom. And then starting in 605, really relevant to our study, 605 through 586 BC, Babylon under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar came in and conquered Jerusalem. They conquered Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple completely in 586. Okay, so here's the situation. You see if we, any of this sounds familiar. <clears throat> All their normal normal ways of worship and religion were stripped from them. I mean, their temple's gone. All the regular rhythms of worship and celebrating together, the feasts of Israel, all of those things no longer being enjoyed. No more breakfast before church, right? Not to mention the fact that those things were taken, but the people were scattered. Some people had fled to Egypt, Against God's will, they fled to Egypt. Some people remained in Jerusalem and some were deported to Babylon to be under Babylonian rule. The people were scattered, isolated from one another, dispersed all across the Middle East, discouraged, not able to see family, not able to see friends, loss of life, hurting. And always we know as God's people become separated from one another, it's inevitable. Spiritual complacency can really begin to grow a spiritual lethargy, and a loss of a focus on the kingdom of God and who God is himself. Persia took over Babylon in 539, and where we find ourselves today with Nehemiah is in around 445 BC. Nehemiah is now under Persian reign, far after all this, and he receives this news of the brokenness of the kingdom, and his response is one that I think we really need to emulate is that the vision that needs to be restored as always the vision that needs to be had is not so much a matter of what needs to be done, but who needs to be known. Our vision this morning must be God himself and the person of Jesus Christ. I wanna invite you to stand to your feet. We're gonna read Nehemiah chapter one. We'll start with verses one through four, but we'll make it through the entire chapter today. 
Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4, you'll hear some of this brokenness even being reported to Nehemiah in these first verses. And then we'll look at Nehemiah's response to begin. <clears throat> this is what God's word says. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, it happened in the month of Kislev. In the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Would you pray with me? Jesus, this morning, I just wanna pray just one thing is that you would break us for what your heart, Lord, is broken for. God, that you would break us for your kingdom, your mission, the advance of your name being known across the globe and in our city, just even in our church body. God, restore us together in a focus on your mission and Jesus on your name like we have never been focused before. Fix our minds on you, God, this morning. Break us from our comfort. Break us in our hearts, whatever is necessary, that we would know and follow you and surrender everything to you, Lord. I pray that you would do that work here at High View. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you, could you please be seated? Like I said, first things first, if we're restoring vision, we need to make sure we understand that our vision must be God himself. Because when God himself is our vision, what happens is we're broken for the things that he's broken for to be restored. So I wanna look at two primary elements this morning. First is that restoration for all this, bro, uh, all this stuff going on in our life begins in a brokenness over just what's going on around us. Restoration begins in brokenness, but we'll see that brokenness doesn't immediately drive us to do anything but to respond to God in humility and prayer. And we'll unpack those things respectively. So let's start with the fact that restoration begins in brokenness. It begins with Nehemiah basically receiving a news report in the 20th year. We can say this morning in the 2020th year, right? We thought it was gonna be, well, it turned quick. The 20th year, probably of King Artaxerxes, when he's in Susa, the citadel, it's when his brother comes, he asks about what's going on, and there, you, we've already read it. He reports that the remnant there is in great trouble and shame, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Spiritual, economic, sociological ruin. I know sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we forget that this is history. We forget these are literal people in a literal city that, have, that has literally been broken down and hurt. People died, separated from their families. We all know our situation of brokenness globally right now. Nationally, because of both, I mean, all kinds of issues, everything from vi the virus to racial injustice, racial unrest, great political polarization. I mean, I don't even gotta tell you, you can feel it and you can see it and you hear it. But the question really comes down to, as, we seeing, as we're seeing all these things around us, how ought we be think, how, ought, how should we ought to be thinking? Can't talk this morning. I love that Nehemiah doesn't respond by jumping on his phone and posting what he thinks on uh, Facebook. He doesn't like respond arrogantly. Like, oh, if we just do this, these, you know, if this, if this people over here would just. I heard these words. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. What we see in Nehemiah is compassion. Compassion. You know, I think one of the greatest failures that we're is before our eyes, especially as a nation right now, is a lack of compassion. You know, certain things may not be affecting you or me personally, 
But it matters not when image bearers of God around us are suffering. That's always our problem. Man, our compassion ought to be stirred when we have seen families who are unable to mourn the loss of our, their loved ones with a proper funeral because of COVID restrictions. That's happened within my own family. We ought mourn when we know that brothers and sisters are, are separated and they're struggling spiritually as a part of the church. We ought mourn. If you've seen the video of a video of like George Floyd, your soul ought to be brought into anguish. No matter who you are. And most of all, what we ought be broken for is the fact that people, it's not, COVID has not all of a sudden put a hiatus on the judgment of God for those who depart from this life. People are still dying apart from the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the gospel to be eternally separated from the love of God in hell. That's not changed. But it was like that before the turmoil started too. Our hearts should always be broken for the kingdom of God. It should always be broken for the things that the heart of God is broken for. But how does this happen? When you read this, were you honest in your heart? I hope you were honest in your heart and mind when you read this, that probably a lot of us could say, man, I've not really mourned and wept like that. What brought this upon him and what will bring this kind of missional, God-fearing brokenness upon us? And I think it's, Nothing less than experiencing and encountering the holiness, the goodness, and the love of God personally. When we experience him and him alone, can this supernaturally be welled up in us? Nehemiah doesn't receive a word from the Lord. He doesn't receive some kind of vision. He receives basically a news report. But it's all about what his mind and his heart was already filled with that led to his response. And I believe that with everything going on, we have an opportunity to view things with a worldly mindset, a naturalistic mindset, or a biblical supernatural mindset. Nehemiah could have automatically shifted and said, well, I'll tell you whose fault it is. It's those Babylonians, man. It's their fault. Oh, King Nebi, you know what he did. It's his problem. Well, then Persia, I mean, Cyrus is a little better. I mean, he's given us a little freedom, but pff, don't like him either, you know? Or is this part, you know, actually what's going on in Jerusalem? It's this group opposing or, oh, you know, I've heard there's this conspiracy that this is going. He doesn't do any of that. He knows the Bible and the Bible saturated his mind. And he knows exactly why they're in the situation they're in. He quotes it later in his prayer. We'll read it in verse eight. God promised if you're unfaithful, you will be scattered. And so what's going on? He knows what's going on is they're under the judgment of God. And so he pleads to the Lord based on the covenant of Israel. I want to be very careful this morning. I did not just say that we are under judgment. We can't draw that parallel theologically in the new covenant. We can't with certainty say, oh, we're under judgment. We can't necessarily say that, but here's what we can know. Under the new covenant, under people saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, there are certain promises and truths that still apply to us. Namely, that Jesus is the son of man prophesied in Daniel chapter seven that is the sovereign ruler over every single king and kingdom that has ever been. Matthew 28, that because of his resurrection as a man, as the son of God, he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And what is he doing with his sovereignty and authority? Romans chapter eight, he's working all things together for good for those who love him and those he is calling to himself. What is God with certainty doing right now? The same thing he's been doing from the very start. He's advancing his kingdom. Is that how we're viewing everything? Or are we saying, okay, God, there's something going on right now. How is this going to be used to win my neighbors to Christ? How is this going to be used to love the people in my community? How is this going to be used so that I can show, man, I'm willing to lay down my life for the name of Jesus and for those around me? That's a completely different mindset. I've heard so many times, Blake, you know, I just think, I think something's going on behind the scenes. Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you what's behind the scenes though. I'll tell you what it is. His name is the Holy Spirit. And he's doing the same thing he's always doing. He's at work in us and to bring about the salvation and redemption that Jesus has worked at the cross. And if that is not what we are primarily broken about and on mission for, our focus is wrong. We, we, our mind's wrapped up in the world. But when we can grasp this kind of brokenness in church and this can be welled up in us, wow, we really just might be used of God. 
And here's what's crazy. This is the craziest thing about Nehemiah in this passage. Okay, y'all ready for this? He's the cupbearer. He doesn't even have to get involved in this. He's literally in one of the most prosperous, safe, influential parts of the kingdom of Persia. He might as well be the chief of staff to the king of Persia in some ways. He's a close, trusted confidant. He's in luxury, man. He's chilling. Nothing's bothering him. Maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. That the virus has been an inconvenience, but you know, at the end of the day, you're doing pretty good. And you don't really have to get involved. Oh man, but then there's the Lord. And Nehemiah knows he can't sit in this illusion of comfort when the kingdom of God is not established. And church, I don't care where you are. You may be in a position of brokenness or everything may be going well for you personally right now. It, it matters not. We cannot sit idly by in any form when the kingdom of God has yet to be fully established, when people are hurting, when people need to experience the love of Christ, when people have not heard the gospel, you better not rest. Can God break us from our comfort? That's a big question in my heart and in this passage. Can God break us from our comfort? And the bigger question may be, do we want him to? Have you prayed for him too? I think the situation Nehemiah is in is so overwhelming. I mean, I think you think, I just don't know what to do. There's so many moving pieces. There's Persia, there's the empire. There's all these restrictions. I don't know. I don't even know how I'm gonna get there. I don't know how I can be a help. I'm not even there. I'm not even city, seen the city myself. And you may be feeling that way this morning, just paralyzed, like, I don't know what to do. Good, you're in a perfect position to come before the Lord. I think often we feel, you know, I'm just one person. I, can, I don't know how to help my city. I don't know how to help my nation. I, this is how you do it. When you place yourself helplessly, but hopefully before God Almighty in complete dependence and say, God, whatever you gotta do with me, I want you to do it. Is that what we're gonna be as a church? Who we're gonna be? Because a right vision of God leads to this brokenness for restoration and that brokenness wells up in putting us in a position to pray. And that's what I wanna do is I want to just read this prayer start to finish. And I want you to just think about what he's saying. Think about what he's praying and then we'll break it down after doing so. Look at verse five. Nehemiah said, quote, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your service Moses, servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. You hear the genuine nature of that God-centered, God-trusting, scripture-filled prayer. I wanna pull up this acronym. It's one that you're gonna be very familiar with, but I wanna break down Nehemiah's prayer through it as an example to, I believe, how we need to, in brokenness, approach our king during this time. ACTS, it's, I just believe, in, includes the, uh, a lot of the essential elements of what a biblical prayer looks like. To come before him first in worship, adoration, to be moved in confession and thanksgiving. And from that, I think, 
supplication, which is basically asking God to supply needs. So let's just walk through this, starting with adoration. Look again at verse five. Right before verse five, he, he, he talks about the God of heaven, but then in verse five, he tells you who the God of heaven is. This is very important. <laughs> Until we identify and are thinking correctly and truthfully and biblically about the God we're praying to, we're actually not actually praying to anybody. We're praying to ourselves. Nehemiah's not praying to the God of goodwill, the God of good vibes, the God of patriotism, or the God of God and country. He's not praying to the little G-O-D generic, I don't know what God we're talking about, God. He's praying to O capital L-O-R-D, God of heaven. This is who God is. If you have all caps in your Bible, Lord, it means behind that in the translation in Hebrew is the divine name, Yahweh. In the King James, it says Jehovah. This is Yahweh, God of Israel, man. This is not just, oh God, like generically. No, this is the covenant keeping God of Israel. And there's only one. Oh, Yahweh, God of heaven. And I like what he says right here. This is the adoration. Great and awesome. Y'all didn't feel it yet. So we're gonna have to spend a little time right here, okay? I know those, use are, those words are overused and abused, but we need to think about it. Awesome as a word has a connotation in the Hebrew of fear. Fear, a good fear. You know the kind when you've been on a really high cliff, I'm, I'm right now about to fall off, I'm almost falling off three times in this sermon. You know, if you ever look on a really high cliff, a really high mountain, maybe you've looked into the chasm that is the Great Canyon and it's almost like there's something magnetic just pulling you down that could swallow you and engulf your life at any moment. Your palms start sweating and you get that chill up your spine. Ooh, that's deep and big. But at the same time, it's the most beautiful and majestic thing you've ever seen. Yeah, God made that. He's awesome. He is great. And he is awesome. And I believe when we are in a position of adoration before the Lord, we're not just throwing up adjectives to appease him. That's not what Nehemiah is doing. Oh God, you're great and awesome. No, he's saying what he's thinking and dwelling upon in scripture that's leading him to call God great and awesome. That this God who said, let there be light and all the creative light of the imagination of God burst forth, forth from the womb and we're able to see each other because everything he created in that moment he did by a spoken word, that God, the God who sustains your breath and the beating of your heart right now, he's great and he's awesome. And Nehemiah begins with worship. As we all always begin, as we approach God, identifying him worship, not because God will be lacking if we don't worship him, but because we will. His glory is independent of what we do. He's great and awesome, but here even more specifically, we really gotta dig into this phrase, okay? He's the covenant keeping God. He's the steadfast loving God who keeps those things with those who love him and keeps his commandment. Our adoration flows out of a correct identification of who we're praying to, a worship for who he is as we dwell on what we know of him in scripture that brings us to an overwhelming sense of worship to him. But it's very, also, it's very essential that we also know the means by which we can appeal to God. Nehemiah doesn't just go before God willy-nilly. He appeals to the covenant. But this morning, I gotta tell y'all, y'all better get excited, okay? Because I'm gonna be excited right now. We're part of a better covenant. We're a part of a new covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. I know I love Nehemiah, but we got something better than him. We don't have Yahweh God of Israel as revealed on the mountain. We have Yahweh God of Israel as revealed in the flesh. And Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He's the image of the invisible God and he's taken on flesh and you can know him personally. Through what? The covenant, the promise. The promise, no other way, not because you know who Jesus is, not because you know he died on the cross. Have you entered into the covenant? I'm not asking if you're a member of a church here. I'm asking you, are you a member of the new covenant marked by the Holy Spirit of God? Our God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in his great love, Luke read it, Romans 5, he sent his son to die for your sins. 
and Jesus has died and taken on the wrath of God for sin. And y'all, somebody better shout, he was raised from the dead, okay? That's crazy. I know you hear it a lot, but that's crazy. He was raised from the dead and he's ascended to heaven. And he extends to us this promise. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Are you saved from the wrath of God? If you entered into this covenant, he offers freely by his grace. That's the best news in the world right there. It's the only means by which we can appeal to God. But when you have believed in Jesus and turned from your sin and followed him, you don't just approach the God of the covenant. You approach him with boldness and confidence. Hebrews chapter four, you draw near to the throne of grace with confidence because you've been given perfect access to the king. Y'all, I know we just spent a lot of time on the A. Y'all are getting a little nervous about what CTS is gonna hold. But usually, you know what I think our problem is? We never do the A. We go straight to the S. But I think what you'll find is more you pray the A, the more you realize how much you don't need the S. Because God's gonna give you the S, it's satisfaction in him. Adoration, but look what this encounter of adoration and thinking about God brings to Nehemiah too. Does it give him, he's Mr. Fix it all of a sudden. He's Mr. Blogger all of a sudden. I know what to do. Six, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night. Listen to his plea. It's over. It's continual for your servants confessing. Here's what he does in responding to the presence of God. He confesses sin, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. So it's a corporate confession for the covenant community, but also an individual. And even I and my father's house have sinned. Church, until we see God clearly, we will never see ourselves clearly. But when we see ourselves clearly, clearly and when we look inward and only then will we be propelled forward horizontally in what God has called us to. But we've got to deal with right here first in our own heart. Notice he's not lashing out in frustration at anyone of Israel, even though it seems like Nehemiah is a man who's walking with God. He doesn't just say, well, it's all of Israel's fault. No, there's such a solidarity to the covenant community. He confesses it as if it's his own problem. There's a toxic kind of individualism that we have in the American West that thinks, you know, that's not my fault. That's not my issue. I don't have to deal with that. And you know what? Certain things may not be our fault, but the plight of mankind is all of our problem. The problems within our church, it, the problem belongs to all of us because we love one another and that we recognize first though, our own sin, our own hearts. If we're ever gonna be sent by God and used by God for the name of Jesus, it's gonna start with a brokenness of confession and complete turning away from the sin that is entangling us. Every great work of God done through people in the Bible starts with brokenness. Isaiah, undone before the presence of God, then sent to preach. John falls flat on his face as if though dead before Jesus, and then he's sent. The woman at the well at Samaria, broken over her sin, just as every single other person encountering God, but sent forward to testify to the grace of Jesus. Where is your life not in alignment with God's word this morning? Because we dare not begin to offer up solutions when we've not dealt with enemy number one. I'm my biggest enemy, you guys. I'm my biggest problem, my, my own sin. And I think we need to be very careful anytime we just start looking like this because here's what's happened. Now our focus is off enemy number one, our own problem, our own sin. It's always our greatest issue before the Lord, because we're responsible for it. And I love how he confesses sin in seven. It's very specific. He says, we've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. It's a very specific confession that's in alignment with God's word. 
That's what confession is. It's identifying where we have fallen short in God's word and bringing that before the Lord and saying, Lord, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not in the right. But I love the hopefulness in it. Remember verse eight, the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. This morning, I'm not asking you to wallow in your sin. I'm asking you to confess it based on the promises of God. He confesses it based on the covenant, knowing that God will show mercy. I wanna show you a promise of the new covenant. John, 1 John chapter one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Why? Because he never breaks his word because he's great and awesome. And he's just because he's already punished the sinfulness of man on the cross and shed his blood. He's faithful and just to forgive us. God will never not forgive your sin if you confess it by the blood of Christ because he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and change us <laughs> and to make his name dwell there. Nehemiah was talking about Jerusalem, but I'm talking about in our hearts. You recognize this morning, God dwells in people. Does he dwell in you? Does he dwell in you? But Thanksgiving, verse 10, I love what Nehemiah says right here. He doesn't say, oh Lord, I hope you redeem us. Oh God, I hope we can still be your people. Oh God, I hope we're your servants. He doesn't wallow in it. His thanksgiving's not explicit, but it's implicit right here because there's a believing and a remembering and a trusting and a thanksgiving over the promises of God that his, his salvation and deliverance is certain. He says, they are your servants and your people. Nehemiah doesn't wonder if there is people. He says, we are your people because we trusted your promise whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Church, I wanna remind you this morning that you're redeemed in Christ. It's not, he, you shouldn't be wondering about it if you've trusted in him because he said it's finished. And that's our confidence though, is we come out from a position of confession and thanksgiving, trusting God will do exactly what he said. Trusting his promises. But as we move from worship to confession and seeing our own sin and being captured by the holiness and promises of God and being stirred up to good works, I love what follows. It's then I think most of the time that we're ready to begin asking God for things. Look what he says in verse 11. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants. And please hear this phrase this morning who delight to fear your name. <sighs> who is Jesus to you? Do you love him? Man, when we start talking about covenant and resurrection, do your bones start rattling? When we start talking about the power of God, does it well up in something within you that you can't explain that says, listen, I don't care what I've got to run through, what wall I've got to run through, what I've got to endure, what I've got to give up. I just love Jesus and want to be with him. Do you delight to fear in him? This is not like Nehemiah. It's like, oh man, I <sighs> guess I'm gonna have to do something about this. Everybody else is doing something about it, you know? No. There's a joy to what God is calling us to, church. But what is the joy? He says this, give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who's he talking about? He says, I was cupbearer to the king. He's talking about the king. He's asking the Lord for mercy to the king. See, because a right encounter with who Jesus is does not then propel us to have some kind of divine genie or divine Santa Claus upon which we just cast all of our wishes. When we have truly encountered who Jesus is and are broken for his kingdom, we know what the holiness of God asks us to most long for and it's to be a living sacrifice on his altar. It's to say, Lord, whatever it takes and that's what Nehemiah is praying right here. 
He knows in his position of influence already what God is calling him to do after being in the presence of God. God is calling him to go petition, to go ask of Artaxerxes a way by which he can help restore the vision for the Jewish people and build up the gates of Jerusalem. But here's why it's a prayer of sacrifice. It's because he knows very well that the king may execute him if he speaks out of place. Are you willing to do whatever it costs to follow Jesus? Whatever it costs. If you're not, it's time to turn around. There's no half in. Would you delight to fear his name? Are you broken for his kingdom? And if you're not, it's time for us to throw ourselves before the presence of God, before his word. Let it saturate our minds and saturate our hearts until he's changed us to love what he loves and love and hate what he hates. Church, he will do it. It's not a question of if, it's he will do it. Will we put ourselves and dispose ourselves to his presence and say, God, do it. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. Restore us together, restore us to your mission. And God, let us give everything for your glory so that your name might be known.